This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. In this episode, we have Joe Sinkwitz, co-founder and CEO at Intelli Influence. Joe, welcome to the Business of Us podcast. Thanks for having me, Art. Terrific. Thank you for coming. All right, let's set it up. One of the big differences in a life of a marketer from, let's say, 10 years ago is that today, a big chunk, if not entire, marketing campaign he or she runs for a product or service takes place on social media. The reason why marketing on social media really works is people, influencers, or creators. My question is, how much do they charge for their service? Well, the answer is classic. It depends. It depends on a particular social media platform and other factors. So we've got Joe today to read this question for you. But as always, we started with introducing our guests. So to kick things off, let's talk about you first. Uh, please tell us about your background, Joe. How did you get involved with the influencer marketing in the first place? Absolutely. So I've been involved broadly with digital marketing for 24 years now. Primarily started like SEO, affiliates, kind of worked my way up. I was the, the chief of revenue officer for uh, Copy Press, which is in the creator space for a lot of writers. Mm. From there, I got poached by a... Um, it was a stealth company out of Los Angeles. They wanted me to be the CMO for a consumer product. It was essentially a, a novel type phone. And this particular phone, you could vape. And so, so it was a very strange product. Well, at the time, uh, budgets were very slim because it was just getting started. I couldn't right. advertise on Facebook ads. I couldn't use Google AdWords. The only thing I could do was get the product in the hands of people that are already in the industry and hoping mm-hmm. they could review it positively. So that was kind of my introduction into the influencer space. Like it was like really shifting from the creator to the influencer. And now at that time, I recognized that there was a lot of influencer agencies, but they're kind of like talent agencies. They charged a big rip. They had like large commissions. Like, you know what? I, I have a programming background. We're going to do right. it ourselves. So uh, I, I launched uh, Intel Phones with Terry Godier in 2016, and we just never looked back. We started with the very small brands, the very small influencers, and just sort of worked our way up. Well, that's great. Uh, you're saying 2016, and for me, it sounds like ages ago, but <laughs> just five years ago. <laughs> but it feels like ages ago. Oh, it feels like a lifetime. We all know why. Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's skip that part. So, okay, if you had 30 seconds, how would you describe what influence, Intel Influence is? Sure. So IntelliFluence is the largest of the warm contact influencer marketing networks. That means that everyone that we have on our platform physically signed up. My goal with IntelliFluence is to democratize influence globally. Right. So these are real people. You're not just uh, scrubbing the internet for the profiles. They gave their consent. They've consciously subscribed to your service. So... This is not just a data aggregation and um, telling people we've got millions of influencers, basically just uh, grabbing them from the um, Instagram, right? Correct. It's it's a true it's a true network. All right. Uh, this August, uh, you published a comprehensive report to tell brands how much would it take uh, for them to run an influencer marketing campaign with influencers. So. How did you decide to create this report and what did it take to pull it together? Yeah, so it was an interesting story. Um, in May, uh, Andrew Evans on our team it was, mm-hmm. it was talking about, he was, he was trying to help solve a problem with uh, pricing guidance. This man. And, uh, yeah, this, this man. And so we, his idea was, hey, you know what? Can we just ask all our influencers how much they want to get paid for everything? We already have general minimums, but we didn't have a really concrete breakdown. So we said, sure, let's do it. We, we spent a, a couple of weeks putting together questions, going back and forth, launched it, got all the data, and then compiled the report in, in August. So it, it wasn't that hard to send it out because we already have everyone's email address. The hard part was getting people to fill out the survey. You have to incentivize <laughs> them a little bit. Um, and, and we can get into it. Like, But the macro level, you know, the people that have over a million followers, 
they don't want to be bothered. Their time is very, very precious. So the data absolutely will skew towards the micro-influencers in our network, but it was really interesting just to see how they felt about everyone. I think they, the, the, the coolest thing that came out, 41% felt that brands were not pitching them the right amounts. They felt like they were just, you know, glossing over all the hard work that goes into being an influencer right. uh, in, in exchange for a low payout. So that was very eye-opening for us. So this is kind of a cliche, uh, the term influencer uh, kind of uh, give them, a, I would say, a better rep. Even though their, their service is in a great demand, brands do want to connect with them. But once they hear the influencer, it's not a marketing agency. Oh, I can just cut up the prices. So they're, not, they're not worth of that you know, regular price take, tag I pay to a marketing agency, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so like, you'll actually see the same thing play out throughout you know, the ad industry, too where you know the, the end user that actually does the work and it filters up through a tiny agency, that agency filters up to a larger and larger and larger right, agency. Exactly. So it's, it's the same thing that's playing out in the influencer world. Uh, I do think a lot of brands are sort of waking up and realizing that, hey, they can go direct. And so as long as they have the right tool sets, they can get everything done that they need to do, but they still need to be smart about how they're compensating people. Gotcha. Uh, so... The report covers fees that are involved to compensate influencers on multiple social media platforms. So let's cover kind of a front runner started with Instagram. So how much does it cost to run a campaign on Instagram with influencers on average? So what we thought was going to happen is we thought it would be a penny per follower because that's been what historically it looked like. And so it like follows like mm-hmm. a linear fashion. And so we do see that from about one follower to 50,000 followers where you go from say, you know, maybe it might be as low as $50 to $500 per post. However, as it's, as you start to get larger and larger audiences in you know, the 75,000, 90,000, over a million, the, mm-hmm. It starts to take on a curve versus a, just a straight line uh, compensation. Um, so you could end up paying several thousand dollars. You know, if if you're trying to find someone that has over a hundred thousand follower uh, count on Instagram, it's just a recognition of what's going on. the The reasoning behind this is what we figured out is there's a constrained supply of influencers on in specific niches that have mm-hmm. very large audiences. So that supply demand curve, it becomes, uh, it becomes a demand uh, elastic uh, uh, ratio. So it's a recognition that they're able to charge, you know, closer to two to three cents per follower, the larger and larger they get. So it kind of takes on this curve. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to take all this data and incorporate mm-hmm. into a predictive, uh, you know, pricing guidelines so that influencers and brands can understand, like, how much should I probably be getting paid? That's a great idea. Uh, so we're talking about the one-time payment for, let's say, um, per campaign or per month? It'd be, it'd be proposed. All right, I, I, I see. So, yeah, that's interesting because we um, certainly there are lots of niches and uh, the supply of influencers is limited. There, there are not that many. Um, plus, I'm sure brands do, do not want to be advertised at the same time. Like you're taking two competitors and <laughs> running two oh, campaigns, absolutely. you know, the same day, it's will be just terrible. So yeah, you've got to be, um, you got to be able to kind of uh, stick your brand to the, uh, to the um, workflow of an influencer on, uh, on a certain period of time. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So the difference between the agency and an influencer basically kind of artificial as, as, as to me. These are people, they're doing the same job. It's about, it's about the talent they have, like uh, charisma, the skills to produce a content. Okay, um, next target will be Twitter. And to be honest, I was kind of um, um, a bit uh, surprised to see a Twitter on the list. Because to me, it's not it's not really a jump up. It's the social media where people can be influenced. So, who are the big influencers on Twitter now, and um, how much does it cost to run a promotional campaign with these people? Sure. So, so Twitter's growth curve uh, in terms of compensation 
is kind of similar to Instagram, but it stays linear for longer because there's less work involved usually with creating a tweet. So you'll right. see it stay at like a penny per per follower for a longer period of time before it shifts exponentially. Uh, like if the big influencers, uh, so we have like 30,000 or so that are on Twitter within our base of 162,000 or so at this point in time. Um, I tend to find that the aggregate of micro influencers is what makes Twitter very interesting. The large people though, like so instance uh, in the angel investing space, Jason Calcanis might be a good example of someone that people will follow. He has, he has very broad uh, views and he's very uh, opinionated about it. Opinions are really what drives Twitter. Elon Musk is another fantastic oh, yeah. example. He, he says anything and people will go driving. Um, this week, uh, so, so the, this is being recorded on the, the, the 17th uh, of September right now. Uh, we have a big story in the United States on Nicki Minaj as it relates to uh, uh, coronavirus. It's it's a wild story. Feel free to look it up. We're not going to get into those particular details. But she has so many followers that when she tweeted out uh, a little bit of misinformation, the White House and uh, several you know, chief medical officers needed to come forward and correct uh, that particular information. So that's the power of Twitter. Twitter is, Twitter is a megaphone. It's putting it out to a broad audience, but it's also really fantastic when brands use it as amplification. So they might do, they might focus a lot on blogs and, and maybe YouTube and, and some of the other channels and then use Twitter to just spread it even further because it's such an easy platform to just get injected into other people's feeds. So I really love it for spreading stories. So it's not about visuals like you would think about Instagram. It's about spreading the word, literally, the opinion uh, from people who are really popular. Um, and I guess the supply is a little bit less, like in terms of the volume uh, with Instagram or kind of a comparative. Yeah, and you're, you're going to have a lot of overlap, too, in audiences. So you, you don't have to pay quite as much. So we're, you're able to get, you know, 25,000 follower for 250 bucks, generally, uh, to just have a quick, you know, 100-character tweet. And so that sort of plays itself out. So uh, when brands look at it and trying to figure out, you know, are they going to hire someone that has a 10 or 100 million following on Twitter, or do mm -hmm. they hire a thousand people that are at the 25,000 range, it usually works better getting more of the smaller just because you're able to spread it faster in different audiences and it can take on its own viral nature and you can get the, you know, some trending to occur uh, a little bit easier too. Exactly. It totally makes sense. Okay. Switching on to the one and only YouTube. Um, I'm not sure that Gen Z, which is my, you know, my daughter is a good example can tell you why it is tube in its name. <laughs> it's kind of a thing that you should be older to get it. But still, hundreds of millions of folks around the world, and teenage included, watch it daily. How much would it take for a brand to compensate the influencer work on a video to feature a certain product on YouTube? It's, it's a great question. And so YouTube especially you have the most production value that goes into it. It's, it's really hard mm -hmm. to do all the editing and the, and the, the, the post-production. So even on the low end, you're probably going to end up paying a couple hundred dollars for a, for a video. Um, right. The exponential curve happens quicker too. So you'll start to see it move from linear to exponential around 10,000 uh, subscription followers or, or, or more. Um, at the higher levels, uh, if you're looking at over a million uh, um, subscribers, you're going to have to be prepared to be spending four, five, six thousand dollars for a video. Uh, it's just a sort of sort of the current reality. But uh, YouTube pairs well with a lot of other networks. So if if a brand focuses on YouTube and they get really good uh, video, they could take that and use it elsewhere. They can embed it within blog posts. They can use Twitter, like we talked about. They could slice it up and use it for Instagram stories. There's just, there's no shortage of it. It's a great place to start if you have a real compelling story. Right, and at bet comparing to other platforms, you can deliver more data points in a report uh, for video content. Like, was it watched entirely? Like, what was interaction to the group with this video content? And video is really like, what, what, what else? What can one? What, what was the better way of presenting something to people as just showing to them in a video clip? Um, Naturally, like one step up in terms of like the hotness will be TikTok. Mm -hmm. Survive many things, competition with YouTube, Instagram, never really happened. 
ban from the Trump administration. I still wonder where, where, where what's going on with that ban at this point. Um, if I'm a brand, how much would I allocate in my marketing uh, plan to spend on the TikTok marketing campaign? So it's a good question. And I think the answer to that tends to be uh, who your buyer demographics are. So TikTok definitely skews more towards Gen Z than millennial. So I actually see the most overlap with, with Instagram and TikTok, where uh, with Instagram, you're skewing a little bit more millennial, a uh, larger share of wallet. They have more disposable income. TikTok, mm -hmm. it, if, it, if it's a lower cost, mass product, culturally relevant, it's going to probably do pretty well on TikTok. But TikTok also makes it really easy to stitch together videos, do duets. So they have some interesting concepts to make it easy for, for a single piece to go viral. They could spend as, as low as, as $100. And the, the exponential curve happens closer to 20,000 followers than, than on, in, than, I'm sorry, YouTube. So it's almost mm -hmm. like twice as big before you start to see the, the compensation jump a whole lot. What's also interesting about TikTok, though, is a lot of the people that are influencers on TikTok, this is their first channel. So they don't have a lot of uh, previous experience. So they don't really fully understand their worth. So sometimes brands can get pretty good deals working with large TikTokers because they're just excited to be working with the brand. Eventually, they're going to be spreading onto other channels as they mature and charge a lot more. But the current reality is TikTok is undervalued. So I, if, if, a, if a brand was coming to me, like let's say they're in a cosmetic space, I would say, okay, uh, you're probably going to want to put 60% um, Instagram, 40% uh, TikTok if you were going to mm -hmm. split it that way. Um, just because okay. you're going to be able to get as much volume from TikTok as you are Instagram, just mm -hmm. but the, the Instagrammers are probably going to convert better. That's interesting. Uh, like I remember one of the factors why TikTok could take it off so uh, quickly, so uh, successfully was that they spent a lot of money, effort, and time in luring influencers from other platforms, from Instagram, from YouTube, on TikTok. So just a general observation in your experience, do you see many people uh, whom you've been working with are in both platforms? You said there are a lot of newcomers on TikTok for whom it's the, you know, the first platform, but can you see the you know, heavy waiters from YouTube being on a TikTok and kind of working from both platforms at the same time? Uh, yes. So I'd say uh, our largest influencers generally are mm -hmm. on TikTok as well. So it, it, for them, it's just another channel. So they may have migrated. So like uh, Christian Collins, you know, he has 14 million or so reach. He wow. started, I believe, on YouTube and then came over to TikTok after he, uh, I think he went YouTube, um, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, something along those lines. So for the larger ones, yeah, it's, it, it becomes a, a destination flow. But for the younger audiences that are kind of getting started, they're mm -hmm. starting with TikTok. Will they move to YouTube? Probably to some degree. Will they move to Facebook? I, I don't think so. So it, it, it's going to be kind of interesting to see five years out if we did like an episode, this is episode 80, if we did episode yeah. 800, and like, hey, where are things now? I, I bet it'd be completely changed landscape. I bet TikTok would be old and we're talking about some new hot network uh, where all the kids are and we'll be a lot grayer. Yeah, things will, will, will shift it and we will be wondering again, what is it about TikTok is a it's no brainer. We know it quite well. What what is this new thing? It, we had no idea at this point what it's going to look like. Uh, just like we had no idea a few years ago what TikTok may look like. Um, what are the general uh, conclusions you can draw from the entire report? The the general inclusion uh, conclusions that we came to was that the the compensation. Um, did not follow a linear path. That was the main thing for me, was seeing that it was linear up to a point and that becomes exponential. I think for, for our managed team and uh, the team that's uh, overseeing our influencers, uh, their general takeaway was these people need to be paid more. And so it's a recognition, like it, we, we kept getting comments about, hey, it takes me three to four hours to create a really good setting for an Instagram post. You know, I, my time is precious. So it was a recognition that, you know, I think overall compensation is going to increase across the market, not just our platform, like all over the place. For influencers, it's going to go up. And so it was a recognition like this is kind of the start of that. Got it. Um, now, recently I've, um, 
I've read a few articles that are talking about the notion of a creator. And we're not talking about religion. We're talking creator in terms of creating content. And the general theme, the general talk is that um, influencers kind of morph into creators, uh, even though there are still classical influencers who are uh, offering their um, service. And what is the difference between two and what brands should know about both? And in what circumstances you would approach a creator and what circumstances you would approach an influencer? Yeah, I, I, I see the definitions as overlapping so much. So in, in my previous you know, iteration of my career, when we were dealing with a lot of uh, blog writers, I viewed creators as, as writers. They're essentially, they're producing a piece of work without necessarily trying to promote it. And so I sort of viewed creators becoming influencers as soon as they started promoting. But then it's kind of taken this different definition, right? Where now we're talking about people that are going forward and they're sort of, they're creating brand lines and brand extensions and their own products to sell. There's a right. different world to the creators. So I, I, so I, I view them so closely together that sometimes when we're doing outreach, I'll use the phrase creator and the phrase influencer in the same paragraph just to make sure that we're covering the bases talking to them because everyone seems to be, they want to be called something different. Like I think you mentioned earlier on where uh, the word influencer sometimes gets a bad rep, um, but at the same time, it's, it's no different than a creator that just understands promotion. So uh, I use them almost interchangeably. All right. Now uh, we've covered the major topic on the table and um, this is the part of the show where I'm asking just a very quick questions to the guests to kind of paint a picture for the audience who he or she is. Here we go. Question number one. What smartphone do you have now? And have you been switching between iOS or Android and uh, or just, just staying one side all the time? Uh, I have an iPhone 8 Pro because I want to I want to be on a slower model than most of my audience so I can make sure that everything that we're doing works well on older phones. Uh, I have not switched over to Android at all. Ever since I was on Palm OS, I moved from that to iOS and I've stayed there. But I, th I think a 8 uh, Pro should run pretty fast it's to this day, right? It, Even it's all that. right. It's I, I, I know iPhone 13 is coming out in like today, um, yeah. but I, I don't have any high appeal to upgrade until I'm kind of forced to. Gotcha. All right. Uh, let's jump back in time. Uh, do you remember your first mobile phone? It was an, it was an old Nokia gray flip phone uh, with a, like a Amber screen. I don't know the model. Like I, would, I, I can't think of the model, but this was back in, 2001, I was a late adopter to phones because I didn't want to be tied down at that time. And then, and of course, the world changed. Now we're all tied down. Yeah, now we're all tied down. That's, <laughs> that's just given. Um, now, today, imagine you've just uh, left your smartphone at home for whatever reason. What would be the most missing feature for you? I'm a dinosaur. So the, actually, the most missing feature is the phone itself, like being able to take and, and you know receive phone calls. That's... That's the place, that's the thing I use it for the most. That's interesting. Uh, every person has its own unique uh, user profile. Um, all right, so um, probably not specifically your iPhone because this is the model like uh, it's just a few years ago, but generally speaking about an iPhone, what would be the feature that uh, probably would make it to upgrade? Like you would think this thing, this is uh, this. Um, new model has a new feature, could be hardware or software that works for me, and uh, I've been missing for this specific one. What would be that feature? I think it would be some sort of mesh with augmented reality and auto translation. So I, I travel the world a little bit. I don't mm -hmm. speak every language for sure. And so it'd be really handy to be able to get off the plane, let's say I was in Kiev, and like go around and you know hold my phone to see oh this is where I go that's the restaurant that was highly reviewed on Google this is where my Facebook friend lives over here that would be a world changer so I I think something like that will make it to the point where I, I couldn't not have my phone with me when I travel. Gotcha, you kind of a Blade Runner view of the world. Yeah, is that their uh, background dystopian? <laughs> Mine is dystopian view. <laughs> Got it. 
Okay. Um, before I let you go, just a very fun, very last question. How can people get in touch with you and get more information about what you do? Sure. Uh, so you could, you could find me on intellifluence.com. My email is joe at intellifluence.com. I answer all my own email, all the thousands and thousands I get every day. I, I try to answer as much as I possibly can. Uh, we're all over social too. So if, if you find Intellifluence and you interact with it, you're going to find us. Terrific. Thanks so much for coming on our podcast. And thank you. Bye-bye, Joe. Did do it. Thank you, Eric. And that was Joe Sinkwitz, co-founder and CEO at IntelliInfluence. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. We release episodes on Mondays, so subscribe and you'll be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review and comment on iTunes. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.